Please turn in the uh, back of your Psalter hymnals at this time to page 872. We'll be reading the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number one. I have strongly urged and recommended that everyone be sure to memorize Heidelberg Catechism question number one. And uh, you should have that memorized. And if not, then get busy. Get on it. You don't want to miss Heidelberg Catechism question number one because you're going to be in a situation sometime and you're going to wish you had had it in mind because you're going to think, now what did that catechism question say? I need that right now. And if you got it memorized, you'll have it. The best of all the catechism questions. Here we get to read it and hear about it today. So let's join our voices together. I'm going to ask the question and you give the answer. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him number of passages we're going to read in light of Heidelberg Catechism question number one, which is about comfort. And what greater book to go to than the book of Isaiah, which is all about comfort. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. Her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And then in chapter 52 of Isaiah, verses 7 through 10, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And skipping over chapter 53, we're going to hear more about 53 in the sermon to chapter 54, verses 6 through 8. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you in overflowing anger. For a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you says the Lord, your Redeemer. And then lastly, in the New Testament, we come to Romans chapter 8. You might say in a lot of ways, Romans 8 is the great comfort chapter of the New Testament. Be reading verses 12 through 39. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. 
For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, but for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus, the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in, in, these, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these comforting words. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts to receive them and bear fruit to the glory of God with a life of gratitude, a life of confidence because of the great grace and comfort you brought to us in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, today's sermon title is taken from Heidelberg Catechism, question number one. It is true comfort. That word comfort is used in a lot of different ways in our English language. There are comforters, little blankets you wrap around yourself, you feel nice and cozy, and you're comforted. There's comfort food, certain types of food that make you feel good. There's Southern comfort, an illegitimate form of comfort in every way, but nonetheless, it's called Southern comfort. What we need, though, is true comfort. Comfort surpasses these other creaturely comforts. True comfort is for the pain and the pained and the distressed, those who are cast down and feel cast away. Those who are dejected or rejected. Those who are, as the saying goes in our common parlance, I'm stressed out. The question is, where we go and get this comfort for that situation? There are creature comforts, an opposite to these, which is held out to us in the Heidelberg Catechism, is the Creator's comfort through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's what I recommend to you this morning. If you have your outline with you, the first point of the outline is a whole, a whole life comfort of faith. The Catechism asks, what is your only comfort in life and in death? The entirety of life itself. What's your great and only comfort in it all? There are many, many false, superficial 
and misleading comforts offered in the world to you and to me, offered for our pain, our depression, our miserable human condition that we all share with the entirety of this world. There is a common curse that afflicts us all, believer and unbeliever. Where do we go for comfort? Well, just like any math problem, there's only one correct answer, and there's an infinitude of wrong answers. <laughs> It's the same with regard to this question, what is your only comfort? Your only comfort in life and death. Remember the words of Carl Sagan, the, the scientist. Billions and billions and billions of years, is what he talked about. But there's billions and billions and billions of false comforts. We need to find that true comfort, the right answer, as the Heidelberg Catechism puts it. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is Jesus Christ. He is the answer to that question. My faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you possess Him? Do you possess Christ? If you possess Christ, it's only because you have faith from your heart in Him. Not just because you know about Him. If you possess Him, then you have become possessed by Him. And if you possess Him, it's because you have become pressed with your need of Him. You have become acutely aware that you need Christ. And thus you possess Him by faith in response to that need. If you've ever had strep throat, you know you've had some of the misery of this life. Strep throat is created by a bacteria. It creates misery. If left untreated, it can turn into what's called scarlet fever. If left untreated, it can kill you. But there is one thing that will deal with strep throat. It's some form of an antibiotic. It deals with bacteria. It will relieve you both of the bacteria and of the consequential misery from that bacteria. Gargling won't do it. High doses of vitamin C won't do it. Getting a vaccine won't do it. Working out vigorously, kick up your immunity will not do it. You need an antibiotic for strep throat. <laughs> the other things won't fix it. There's only one comfort in life and death. And that one comfort is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have recognized and felt your disease of sin and misery, specifically analyzing what the true problem is, then you will recognize that Jesus Christ is the one and only remedy. It's the only comfort now that is in the entirety of the life of a believer and is the only comfort in facing death and in passing through death. Only then, by faith in Christ, will you belong in life's entirety, that is, body and soul in life and death, to Christ. But what about Christ specifically that brings this comfort. The Heidelberg Catechism points it right out to us, right out of the chute here. He has fully paid for all my sins by his precious blood and has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. The cross of Christ is the means of comfort. As we read in Isaiah chapter 40 and elsewhere, we read of comfort. Isaiah 40 through 66, some uh, scholars call that Deutero Isaiah, because the tone changes quite radically when you hit chapter 40 of Isaiah. Some scholars have recommended Isaiah has, has two different authors because it's so different from the first part to the second part, which is wrong. 
Just because you got two different messages doesn't mean you have to have two different authors. It's not difficult to figure out. But Isaiah, that second half of Isaiah is often called the book of comfort. Because it comes right out from the beginning. Oh, comfort, comfort my people. And the word comfort keeps occurring throughout those chapters. Or what was Isaiah speaking of when he was proclaiming comfort to the Old Testament people of God? What was he addressing with regard to what misery they were having? Well, Israel was in exile. They were exposed to their enemies. Uh, they were uprooted from the promised land. They were, they were kicked out. They were eking out a, uh, I guess you might say, a very difficult, low-buck existence. Not the prosperity that they had enjoyed for a period of time in the promised land. And they're living with a consciousness, an awareness. Why am I here now and not where I wish I could be? It's because of my own guilt. It's because God had warned me and He told me if we disobeyed, I could suffer the curse and be scraped off that land and sent into captivity. And now here I am. How miserable. How guilty. Seventy years in captivity they were. Getting their comeuppance under God's judgment. But now as we come to Isaiah chapter 40 and Isaiah the prophet speaking to them, what is he doing? He, he's now saying, look, your God is coming to you. The God who reigns <laughs> and rules is your God and He's coming to you. He's coming to comfort you and deliver you. He's forgiving you of your sins. And He's going to set you free. So we read that in Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people. Your warfare is ended. Your, uh, it's over. You're, the Lord's forgiven you. He's pardoned you. And then later on in chapter 52 uh, of Isaiah, uh, we, we, we read of this declaration of good news uh, coming down uh, from the heavenly spheres, coming down from Mount Zion, being proclaimed to Israel as she is in uh, captivity. And the Lord is going to redeem her. Uh, the Lord is going to uh, return to her uh, and turn those waste places uh, again into prosperity, to turn their weeping into uh, singing. As, as the text says, the Lord has comforted His people. He has redeemed Jerusalem and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Chapter 52. And chapter 54, again, uh, it's this message of, of the Lord's compassion coming to her who's been deserted. Uh, the wrath of God, the judgment of God had lasted only for a while. Now He's coming back to them to re-embrace them as His covenant bride. Bring comfort. So chapter 52 and chapter 54 of Isaiah are, are, are bookends to what's in the middle. And what's in the middle? Well, chapter 53. And what is in chapter 53 of Isaiah? But a wonderful prophecy of Christ's cross. It's called the suffering servant text. There's four of them and this is the, the fourth one. And we read here in verses four or 5 and 6 of Isaiah 53, but He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of his own. Here's the central prophecy. Here's the grounds and reason that Isaiah can now proclaim deliverance of Israel from captivity because one has come and will bear their curse. It's a substitutionary suffering it's an in my place, condemned he stood kind of suffering. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgressions. See, substitution. 
The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is comfort, you see. This is the, this is the content of the comfort. As the Heidelberg Catechism puts it, he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. And he has delivered me from captivity to the devil. That great comfort is set before us uh, also in the New Testament in Romans chapter 8. It brings home this comfort in a very clear and crisp manner. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, how is God for us that no one can be against us? Well, Paul goes on to explain. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. That means he delivered him up. To his death upon the cross, how will he not also graciously give us all things that is glory, resurrection, life because of his cross? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. <laughs> who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is he who died. You see, that's, that's the comfort. It's the ground of the comfort. Yet yeah, my sins are many. My sins are great. My sins haunt me. My sins bother me. My sins weigh me down. They are thorns in my flesh. And the devil comes and jumps up and down upon those thorns to drive them in even deeper to afflict me. What do I do? Is there any comfort for me? Am I irretrievably a mess? Uncomforted? Not at all. God has sent Jesus to remove our guilt. He has sent Jesus to replace our guilt with His righteousness. That's justification. And therein to secure for us reconciliation with the Father. No more laboring under the Father's frowning displeasure and judgment. But to be inheritor of life. That's comfort. And not only has he fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, but the Heidelberg Catechism also recognized he's delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. The king of darkness. Outside of Jesus Christ, you are a servant of the devil. You are, you got to serve somebody. The old song by Bob Dylan, you got to serve somebody. That is true. You, are, you cannot avoid the truth that you are a servant either of the devil or of Christ and there's no middle ground. If you do not have Christ and accept the truth, whether it's willingly or by deception, you're a servant of a cruel taskmaster who's an expert in not only getting you to sin, but then beating you up for it. And so the Heidelberg Catechism emphasizes this deliverance from the tyranny of the devil. And that's a comfort we so desperately need as believers in Jesus Christ. The devil is mapped out. Satan is mapped out. Is an accuser of the brethren. He loves to accuse. Paul says that he shoots fiery darts. Those are darts of accusation. The devil takes what is true about us and uses it to beat us up ruthlessly. And that's why we must have a shield of faith. Shield of faith in what? Shield of faith <coughs> in what Jesus Christ has done. But he has released me from my sins and thus he has released me from Satan by his cross that I might what? Now belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I now belong to him, bought and paid for by him, delivered from the curse and given comfort instead for the entirety of my life. And that means belonging to Christ, being His purchased 
product. By redemptive rights, <laughs> no longer belonging to myself, no longer belonging to Satan's territory, belonging to Christ. I'm in good hands now. I'm in good hands. I'm in the hands of the sovereign God, as we read in Isaiah 52. Your God reigns. You're in His redemptive hands. Good news. The, the sovereign God is the God of sovereignty. That means He's just not up there being sovereign. God, I'm glad you're up there being sovereign. Look up there and see His throne. No, it, it means something very concrete. That means that in life itself, He is ruling and reigning. He is providential in a fallen world. So the Heidelberg Catechism completely contradicts all deism. You know what a deist is? A deist is a person who believes that God wound up the world in the beginning like a clock and then took his hands off and let it go. Well, that's not what Scripture teaches, and that's not what our Heidelberg Catechism teaches other either. But the Heidelberg Catechism brings us uh, this further comfort the comfort of the Father's sovereignty. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. There is no mistakes in God's plan. No mistakes. Not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father. That's, that's from Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus reminds us what? We should not fear. Life's scary. Bad things happen in this world. Traumatic, difficult, painful things happen. And sometimes when you least expect it. Jesus says, do not fear. Don't fear their fear. The, what, what, we, the, the greatest fear is the fear that we're going to die. That's the big fear of life. We're going to die. We're going to suffer. We're gonna die. Don't fear. Fear him who is able to what? Kill body and soul in hell. Fear God instead. The, the one who is your father, who is in control of all things, so as Romans 8, 28 says, that all things are working together for good. Everything for the believer and, 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 and for all believers in all times are all working together for this grand conclusion that is good. It's the outcome. It's the adding up of all things in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. For the believer in Jesus Christ. And so thus, as he passes through this world, he knows God is in control and where it's headed for ultimately. And, but it's like a tapestry. On one side, of, if, you, if you've seen a tapestry before, and you see how beautiful some tapestries are, but if you turn the tapestry over, it looks like a rat's nest. And that's how life sometimes looks to us. It looks, it looks like life is a rat's nest. Sometimes we go through things and he said, I'm not just in a rat's nest. I'm thrown overboard and I've got a weight on my leg too. And that's how we, we feel and sense and look at what's happening in our lives. It doesn't mean we're deluded or unreal. We don't become Christian scientists. I'm going to think my way out of this thing. No, we recognize what? We recognize that in the midst of this, we have a sovereign God who loves us and whom we belong to as our Father through life, and he's at work in and through this, developing something. He's developing something in us in this world that is conformity to Christ, growth in holiness, deepening of our faith and trust in him, and an ultimate outcome in body and in soul. Just as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, we, are not only, we not only suffer, but we are heirs. Heirs of what? The, the eternal kingdom of God. 
So we may not know what is next, but we do know Him who not only knows what is next, but controls what is next. And Psalm 103 reminds us with additional comfort that as our Father, He knows our frame, that we are but dust. And His eye is upon us with compassion. And He knows us personally. And He is with us personally. Praise God. There's, there's, there's the eye of faith. I have faith clings to the promise of God. It, don't, it doesn't always sense the promise. I always appreciated a little piece that John Owen once wrote. It's a little portion he wrote. It's called Faith and the Sense of It. Faith and the Sense of It. See, it's one thing to sense to the comfort of your soul. The Lord's with me. But sometimes you don't sense it. And that's where you must distinguish between faith and the sense of it, as Owen distinguishes. Because faith will still look to God apart and through what you do not sense to rest confidently in Him. And God's presence is with His people to the end. And that is that presence is the comfort of the Holy Spirit's presence. As the Heidelberg Catechism goes on to state, because I belong to Him, Christ by His Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. There is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That the comfort of the Holy Spirit assures us what? That we belong to Him. Again, we can distinguish between having salvation by faith from having the assurance of salvation by faith. I had a good friend of mine throughout my college years who definitely believed and trusted in the Lord but struggled the whole time I knew him with the assurance that he had it. <laughs> what does God do for us? Well, initially, fundamentally, he gives us the Holy Spirit. So we, re we read in, in Romans chapter 8, didn't we? The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit enables us to tenderly, confidently, by faith, cry out to God and recognize Him. Abba, Father, of His good will, His good care in our lives. The Spirit enables that. So thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit that assures us of eternal life. That assures us that I do belong to Christ. And that Spirit that helps us to pray, Abba, Father, that Spirit that bears witness that we are children of God. Also, Paul goes on to say, the Spirit itself is also praying within us. Because often we don't know what to pray or how to pray. Thank God the Holy Spirit exceeds and goes beyond our own capacity as we search for words or uh, what am I to say to God in light of this, that, or the other thing. That's, it's a marvelous and amazing thing. But Paul also tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, that that Spirit that dwells within the heart of every believer is a seal. It's a seal. It's, uh, that, that means it's, a, it's, a, it's an assuring presence that we do not belong to ourselves. That's what a seal did in, in the ancient world. A seal would identify who a certain document belonged to or who it came from. And so the Holy Spirit is that seal that it's come from God and we belong to Him. The Heidelberg Catechism maps out that we have that in sh uh, spirit that assures us, but not only assures us of eternal life, but also works within us. And, and actually, it, it brings us full circle. 
as it works within us back to Christ. It makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. And when you receive Christ, when you trust in Christ, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, from that time you have a sense, not only do I belong to Him, but I want to live for Him. I want to walk anew in Him. And every time we come to the Heidelberg Catechism, question number one, we should say to ourselves, okay, Lord, let me renew this with You. From now on, let me live for You. I've drifted in this way or that way. I've compromised in this or that. I've stumbled and fallen and gotten caught in this or that. Now, from now on, Lord, let me live wholeheartedly not half-heartedly. No, take more of me to, to be willing and ready to live. That's sanctification. And it's because of the presence of the Holy Spirit that Holy Spirit helps me to know Him and to enjoy the comfort of knowing Him. And that's the second catechism question on Lord's Day number one is how many things must you know if you are to live and die in the joy of this comfort? How, what do you need to know? Three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am delivered from all my sins and misery. Third, how I thank God for such deliverance. Those three things together enable us to enjoy the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ because we know these things. They give us that confidence. Zacharias Ursinus, the main author of the Heidelberg Catechism, also wrote a commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism as well. And, uh, how many people have that commentary other than me? Uh, at least a couple of us have that commentary. I, I want to encourage you that over the next year, as I preach through the Heidelberg Catechism, I want to encourage you, get your sinus, your sinuses commentary on it and read through it over the next year. It's, it's rich, as he explains and opens up the rich theology that is there. But Well, he said this. He said, without the knowledge of our sin and misery, we cannot hear the gospel with true profit. We must know the disease in order to properly appreciate the physician's medication. See, that's what we must know. I must know first how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I'm delivered from all my sins and misery. And that's what your sinus is trying to drive home to us. See, in other words, it's the preaching of both law and gospel that are the instruments the Holy Spirit uses in our lives to do what? To give us the knowledge, the confidence, I am a sinner, I am miserable, I know why. The law shines into my life, shows up my sin. I need Christ to save me from that. I don't need Christ to make me happy. I don't need you know, Christ to you know, give me my next meal, per se. What I really, truly need Jesus Christ for, I need Him as the Savior from my sins, which is the true cause of my misery. And so we have those two uh, portions of knowledge in order so that we can live and die in the joy of this comfort. The law showing me my sin, the gospel, the grace of God, how I am delivered from all my sins and misery through my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood. Ursinus points out here in these three categories of uh, grace, then guilt, and then the third one, gratitude. I'm to thank God for such deliverance. He points out that this is the division of the, of the catechism, these three. The first part of the catechism deals with your sin and misery. The second part of the catechism deals with the grace of God that comes to us in Christ. And then the third part of the catechism deals with, okay, now that I'm, I belong to Christ, how do I show my gratitude toward Him? It's a life of gratitude, that's how. It's, it's God has directed me to show Him gratitude. And, and also, uh, Ursinus points out that not only does the three question help us 
uh, to understand the divisions of the catechism. But these three questions also help us to understand the divisions of Scripture. Ursinus hammers this in his commentary, not so much in the Heidelberg itself, but in the commentary that the Scripture has two parts. It has law and gospel that, of course, fit together, showing you your sin, showing you your Savior, showing you your need, showing you the answer to the need, showing your disease, showing you the physician to heal that disease. Have you become personally acquainted with what Catechism Question 2 is talking about? Are those just kind of headings <laughs> of a catechism? Or have you become personally acquainted with those things? Personally acquainted with your sin and misery? The point that has weighed you down? Personally acquainted with the saviorship of Christ and His cross in your behalf? Personally acquainted with being thankful, grateful for this deliverance and wanting to know how can you express your gratitude toward him. Do you, in other words, do you experientially have this knowledge? Has it impacted you so that the orbit of your life has been radically adjusted to orbit around Christ? Well, Heidelberg Catechism, question number one. As I mentioned in the beginning, it is the richest of all catechism question foods. It really and truly is. And you might say that with Heidelberg Catechism, question number one and number two, along with it, you have, as it is, a spiritual Uber driver that is driven right up to your front door, driven right up to the door of your heart so that you could hear the gospel doorbell ringing. Do you hear it this morning? Can you hear the bell ringing? The delivery driver from the heavenly Mount Zion is standing outside your heart with heaven's true comfort food warm, steamy, complex, and comforting in its aroma. Is he there? Do you hear him? Are you hungry? Are you stressed with sin and misery? It's this delivery man that extends this delicious, steaming gospel food for you and for me right to the front door. And what's in it? What's in that delivery container? One word. Comfort. Comfort. As your sinus says elsewhere, he said, the substance of this comfort consists in this, that we are engrafted into Christ by faith, that through him we are reconciled to and beloved of God, and that thus he may care for us and save us eternally. Now what will you do? Will you shut the door? Walk away? Shut that door and say, well, I'm going to wait for the, the little Caesar's driver instead. Or will you reach out gratefully now with a hand of faith for this great gift from the kingdom of God and receive your only comfort in life and in death. The true food of your soul, the true medicine of your disease, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray.